I was just thinking during that wonderful meditation, thank you, what if every meeting of the United Nations, every meeting of your government and everybody else's government, every meeting of every college and university and hospital began a day like that? What a difference that would make. And thank you for these wonderful words. I'm very touched, especially that you remembered my daughter. Because my grandson was born exactly six months ago. And so I'm a besotted grandma. Um, yesterday, I learned so much from all our wonderful speakers. And I think uh, one of the functions I can perform today is to begin to see what happens when we apply what we learned yesterday to some of the problems of the world. So I want to begin with a, <clears throat> a, an account of an incident that happened in 2003, just after the invasion of Iraq. And it happened that Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes of the United States Marines was leading his men on a foot patrol. This was in the days when you still could have a foot patrol in an Iraqi city, down the streets of Najaf, near Baghdad. And all of a sudden, a huge screaming mob came from the houses on either side of the street. People clearly furiously angry and shouting, waving their fists. And of course, none of the young men in the platoon spoke Arabic, so they had no idea what the problem was. Chris Hughes strode straight into the middle of the whole throng with his weapon pointed at the ground, and he shouted to his men an order they had never heard before. Kneel! So with their heavy backpacks and their helmets and their weapons, they wobbled to the ground and put the barrel of their guns in the sand. And immediately, immediately, the whole melee, the whole crowd went silent. These kneeling soldiers from another country. And after two or three minutes, everybody dispersed and went home. Now this story touches me so much because that lieutenant colonel, that soldier, had enough presence of mind and enough empathy to do what was necessary to prevent a massacre. If he hadn't been in the instant, and if he hadn't known instinctively what was necessary, hundreds of people would have been dead that day. Because one of the things we've learned working in conflict areas for so many years is that one of the biggest drivers of armed violence is humiliation. And the immediate and best antidote for humiliation is respect. And that's what he did. He had his men show respect, even if there was no understanding of any words whatsoever. And so this is, um, for me, one of the most important applications of what we're doing here to what happens in the world. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the people I work with who take this even further. So, what, what, what Chris Hughes did was to embody both empathy and awakened leadership. Now, if I could get this slide to work. Mm. Can you help me? Thank you. 
Um, in this story, we learn that compassion is not just kind and helpful, but it can actually save lives. And I'm sure many of you have had that experience. Thank you. And which way, which way do I press it? Sorry. Thank you. So many of those driven to save the world are filled and driven by fear and anger. And I know because I was. In 1982, I was filled with fury that the world was being threatened with nuclear holocaust by two superpowers. And I began to learn just what the capacity of nuclear weapons was. And I was um, working at the UN in New York and it was a six-week conference on disarm nuclear disarmament. And after two weeks, absolutely no progress had been made. And so there was a huge demonstration on the streets of New York. I went down and joined in. It was totally peaceful, and it brought a million people to New York. And the next day, the New York Times gave it five pages, and I rushed into the UN to do my work, feeling absolutely confident this would change everything. <coughs> It changed nothing. No country changed its position one half centimetre. And I was struck hanging on a tram on the way home that evening, just distraught and depressed. And suddenly it dawned on me that the people in the UN had no power. And what we needed to do was find out who did have the power of decision over nuclear weapons, because somebody must have. So I packed up my job, went home, and used my savings to start a research group called Oxford Research Group, round my kitchen table. All the best research groups start round somebody's kitchen table. And uh, everybody said, you're mad, you'll never find out how the whole thing works. Well, we put our minds to it. There were just three of us. And over four years, we were able to research and publish our first book, which was called How Nuclear Weapons Decisions Are Made, with charts and diagrams of all the weapons warhead laboratories in each of the five nuclear then countries, China, France, Britain, U the United States, and the then Soviet Union. The intelligence agencies that provide the rationale for the weapons, the military who do the, do the deployment, the foreign services who um, do the negotiations, and the treasuries who sign the checks, and ultimately the politicians who have their finger on the button. And what we discovered was that almost all these people were completely out of touch with public sentiment and public feeling. And um, I wanted to open a dialogue with these individuals. We published a book a little bit later and there were 650 biographies in it, names, addresses, and even telephone numbers of 650 nuclear weapons policymakers worldwide. And what I wanted was for people like us in this room to actually open a discussion with those who were making the decisions. Um, and I realized very quickly that I wasn't capable of it because I was still filled with fear and anger. And therefore doing the inner work, doing the work with our own emotions, is as vital, possibly even more vital, than anything we do in the world. And I would go further to say that if we don't do the inner work, if we don't understand and process our emotions, the work we do in the world can be actually um, catastrophic. I've seen many non-governmental organizations torn apart by people's strong emotions that they haven't processed. So everybody that I train at the moment is almost is essential that they go through a process of understanding how they tick and a regular meditation or reflection practice. So, fast forward a little bit. 
And you must keep my eye on the timer. And you must go like that when I've got five minutes. Um, I um, decided that the only way forward was to try and uh, interview a number of British decision makers. So for my doctorate, I interviewed 13, and I did cognitive maps of the way they thought as they were talking to me. And as you know, if you've done cognitive mapping, there's always a sink into which, or out of which, all the thoughts come. And for 12 out of 13 of the individuals, the sink was feeling threatened. So from childhood, these individuals had felt the threat. And that's why they did what they did. So I wrote to them and told them what I'd done and asked them if they'd like to see the cognitive maps. So I went back and talked to them and listened to them again. That's the important thing, is the listening. And so by the end of um, that process, I had been five or six hours with each individual. And some trust had built up. And then it occurred to me I could invite them to an old, wonderful old manor house outside Oxford to meet their opposite numbers from the other nuclear countries. So we had the head of Los Alamos Warhead Development in the United States meeting his counterpart from the Soviet Union and China. They'd never met. And, importantly, meeting their informed critics. Now, these were people who'd been uh, in the business, as it were, in the nuclear business, and decided, for good reasons, to come out. But they were sufficiently well informed to make the discussions fascinating. And, of course, we had to do it completely below the radar. No press, no, no communique. Everybody could completely deny that they'd been there. But what happened was that these individuals began to take off their mask, let go of the constituency sitting on their shoulder, and see the other as a human being. And that led to us taking delegations to China, um, to Moscow, and uh, Geneva, New York, and so on. But it was all done on a shoestring. Um, we, we, the only money that we had to support us was actually from Quaker Trusts in the UK. Anyway, uh, I had begun in the, about 1988 to learn to meditate, actually with the Quakers. And you know, Quakers just sit in silence for an hour. And um, so I thought, what if we brought this in? Because it, it was giving me so much depth and strength and reassurance. So I invited five key meditators that I knew if they would come and sit in the library underneath the room where the meetings were going on. So I called them the standing stones. You know those old circles of stones? And bless them, they would sit there all day for two days and a half. And at the end of the second day, at one of the meetings, a guy from the State Department came to me. And we were in this beautiful beamed hall above the library. And he said to me, he said, oh, there's something very special about this room. And I said, yeah, it was built in 1360. And he said, no, 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 there's something very special. And I said, well, people have been doing yoga in this room and listening to one another and so forth. And he said, no, there's something coming through the floorboards. <laughs> And I said, well, yes, you're right. Do you want to know what it is? And he said, yeah, yeah. And I told him, and he went white. And I said, well, if you don't believe me, go and talk to those older people who serve you your lunch. It's them. And so he came back after lunch with a little smile on his face and just nodded. I think he thought we were crazy. But what I know from that experience, and many we've ever since then, we have always had meditation supporting all the work that we do. And without it, I think it would have been quite different. <coughs> so, um, I, 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 after doing this work for 21 years, I became fascinated by the stories I was hearing of people at the coalface, what I would call at the sharp end of hot conflict. 
people who were working in places like Zimbabwe, Colombia, um, the Congo, Egypt, and who were local people leading initiatives to prevent people killing each other. So I had, we did some research and we were able to identify 350 such initiatives worldwide. I was surprised how many there were, which were viable, responsible, and um, con continuing. They weren't just a flash in the pan. And we wrote up 50 of them in a book called War Prevention Works. And then I thought, well, let's start another organization. So we started Peace Direct, actually to support these individuals who were exposing them, themselves, their families, um, and their livelihood to, um, to, to death every day to save other people's lives. So I want to now just introduce um, you to some of them. And um, let's see if we can get... This is Zalash Tkhalemzai, who was born in Afghanistan. And she gave up a glittering opportunity to go and study at Harvard six weeks ago to go and work in a refugee camp in Lesbos, where there are 1,200 people living in a, a dilapidated chicken factory. And she's told me about the conditions there, and it's so horrific. And there is so much desperation amongst the refugees, mostly Syrian. There have been two knife fights already, and she's just so much wanting people to go and help and support, particularly the children. She's really worried about the children growing up in this toxic atmosphere. Um, now I want you to meet Henri. Now the man in the middle was a child soldier himself and he managed to escape. And now he's devoted the rest of his life in the Congo, right in the middle of Africa, to uh, rescuing children who have been kidnapped to be child soldiers and sex slaves. So what he does is when Peace Direct sends him, say, $100, he gets on his motorbike, rides into the bush, and buys a herd of goats. And then he herds the goats to where the militia are hiding, because he knows where they are. And that in itself risks his life, because the militia are trigger happy, they are high on drugs, and they don't like strangers. Um, but he knows how they work and how to talk to them. And he then trades one goat, price $5, for one child, and brings the children home to their families. And then the hard work begins of reintegrating these children who have been trained, actually, to kill people in their own villages. Sometimes they have to go and kill their own parents. So these are highly traumatized kids, and that's what Henri does. Um, and he remains, you can see his face. Just look at his face, this, what this man has seen and what he knows. These are some of the wisest people in the world. This is Gulalai Ismail, and you may recognize the young woman next to her. Gulalai lives and works in northwestern Pakistan, in the Swat Valley, which is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a woman. And she, uh, when she was 16, started a move to get girls into school. She calls it Aware Girls. And that on the, on the left, you probably know who that is. She won, she was shot in the head for doing just that. Um, Malala Yousafzai. And, um, but Gululai, completely undeterred by the shooting of Malala, went on to train 250 young men and women to go into the madrasas and identify the young men mostly who are being trained to be suicide bombers, to be jihadis, and go home with them to their families and sit down and discuss why the Quran would not want them to be suicide bombers. And so far they have dissuaded over 200 potential suicide bombings. And her life is under threat, absolutely every day. Um, now what I'm doing is, let's see who else we've got here. Oh, that's, <laughs> I'll go back a second. Keep, stay with, with, with Malala for a second. Um, 
What I'm doing now is applying what we've learned from these incredibly brave people to training young social entrepreneurs. For example, in Berlin, there's a wonderful school called the Do School, which attracts uh, young people from all over the world and then trains them how to set up social projects which will provide employment um, and or spread education and so on. And what I've done with them is to balance that with a course in self-awareness and self-knowledge uh, to include reflection and meditation because, like you, I know that when we have this inner capacity, this what I call inner power, as well as our ability to do what we do in the world, the combination of the two is more than doubly as effective. And I really feel this deeply. And when, particularly young people, when they get this, and you see the different way they handle conflicts, the different way that they handle communication even, the way that they listen. Um, and I, I think of all the things that, that we learn doing this, it's um, the ability to listen which is the most important. We all think we're good listeners. Only about 5% of us are. Um, and when I, sometimes just in order to make ends meet, I work with big corporations and train their leadership teams. And people at the very top of these huge corporations, when I say to them, are you good listeners? And they absolutely. And then I put them through these exercises and my God, they realize that they haven't heard a thing of what the other person said, <coughs> much less the emotions that were behind it. So that realization begins a process of just learning how inadequate is 90% of our so-called communication during the day. Um, essentially also is for anybody in any leadership position is to deal with their own difficult feelings before we project them out on somebody else. I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with the notion of projection. And when we, <clears throat> if for example I'm, I'm angry inside, and if I project my anger about nuclear weapons, for example, out into the world, it's like gasoline, and I can throw a match in it and the whole thing will go up. But if I put that anger inside, as it were, my engine, it becomes fuel. And it drives my capacity to get up in the morning and do it again. And it's that, uh, it's often these strong emotions that actually I find, I may be wrong, but it, I find they keep me going, but they have to be contained. They have to be examined, they have to be understood. And um, uh, I have all sorts of exercises uh, for people to actually meet their inner dragons. Because one of the characteristics of all these peace builders, and it just moves me so much, is that they are prepared, day after day, to walk towards <coughs> what frightens them most. And that's not just out there, it's in here. They're prepared to confront and work with, and they love to get the tools to work with their inner demons. Thank you. Um, so, when they do this work, you can see that their serenity and their security is magnified just enormously. Um, so what they're doing really is discovering the inner beloved. And we talked about that yesterday. Um, to, dis to discover how lovable we are. And that's the fuel that fuels this gentleman who brings the other star quality to every kind of peace building you can imagine, and is this man. Um, he has the ability to walk into a room and literally scan it like that, and he will know what every person in that room needs. And he will, if he feels the time is right, he will see to it 
that they get it during that meeting. And the other thing is that he just makes you laugh the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and him and the Dalai Lama together, I mean, they've just written a book together called Joy. Um, and so, um, I'd like to finish by saying um, that I believe that listening is the greatest gift that any person can give to another person. To really listen to somebody else, totally, without um, judging, uh, without analyzing, just giving them your full attention is the greatest gift you can give to free not only them, but yourself from conflict and become what we call <coughs> a sacred actor.